What's up, church family? How are y'all today? And new friends, good to see y'all. Thanks for coming today. We're so glad you joined us. This is the day the Lord has made, and we'll rejoice and be glad in it. And I'm so glad that you've chosen to come worship with us today. Uh, we're glad all of you are here, and uh, I'd like to connect with you. I'd like to uh, pray for you and know your name. And so I'd like for all of you to take out your connection card and fill it out. And as you exit, uh, place it in the uh, boxes there, at the, the offering boxes as the entrance. And uh, let us know of your attendance. Let us know uh, any prayer requests you have. It always uh, blesses me to get to be a prayer partner with you through the week. And so uh, we're glad you're here, glad that you chose to come worship with us. Uh, for those of you that may be our guest, we have an area over here for those that are especially high risk and would like to practice physical distancing and wear masks. So if you feel uncomfortable with uh, people not wearing masks over in this section, uh, we have an area where we're trying to provide a contact-free environment for those folks. Uh, just a couple of announcements today. Uh, this next Saturday, we're going to have our trunk or treat and we actually need more trunks, and we need more treats, and we need more people to volunteer and decorate in that uh, way. And then also, uh, Brother Tom over here in the bright fall sweater, uh, the orange sweater, is uh, our, uh, leading our choir practices, and they're on Sunday afternoons. And he wants all of you to know that you're all welcome. Now, I may be excluded, my voice isn't quite good, but he would love to have all of you in the choir. And so anybody that's thought of being in it or that's ever been in the choir, he would love to have you come join them this afternoon for their choir rehearsal. Uh, why don't you join me? And let's all stand and let's begin worshiping with our praise team.
Thank you for this morning, God. Thank you for this time of worship. Um, please be with Brother Charlie as he, Lord, and God, just thank you for everything you've done for us, Lord. We, we can never repay you, and, but God, we, we love you, and we're here to, to worship you. Amen.
If you're a guest this morning, we have a listening guide in the program that you can uh, use to follow along. If you uh, were not with us Thursday night, this stage was transformed. It was totally different. And we saw things I don't know if I'll ever see again. We saw flames leaping out of the floor. We heard testimonies. It was something else. But uh, it was a great time. And as I was talking to people as they were leaving, uh, one couple, I was asking them how they found out about it. We had some people who rode in on motorcycles from way off and people that came from another part in the state. And uh, there was a young couple that came in and they said as they were driving home from work, the, the wife, she saw the tour bus, and so she knew there was a concert. She saw the sign, free concert, so she checked online, and they came and uh, thoroughly enjoyed it. And uh, as I was standing there, one lady left, and uh, she had a son with her, and um, she uh, was introducing herself to us and uh, asking our names. And there's almost a half a dozen of us there. And so she was going around, and I thought, you know, this lady is trying to, she's going to really try to learn our names. And so she collected everyone's name, and she came to me, and I thought, I I'll help her, because, boy, I know how hard it is to learn people's names. I'm still trying to learn some of your names. And if you would help me out by every time you come up to me repeating your name, it would help me because I'm always trying to place a name with a face, and sometimes I get them confused. Uh, this past week, somebody introduced me and said, it's going to be easy for you. Said, his name is the same as my name. I was like, yes, one less name to learn. But this lady, she was doing that. So to try to help her out, I said, well, my name's Charlie, like Charlie Brown. You know, give her something to think about. Do you know what that lady did? She turned around and said every one of our names. I mean, she retained them. Most of us, when we hear a name, I don't know, maybe you're not like me, but it goes one ear out the other. I mean, it's hard to retain names. And uh, it's, it's uh, impressive when people learn names. And um, I don't know about you, but I, I kind of use that because I grew up on uh, peanut cartoons. And I don't know if you like cartoons or not. I do. But one of the things I don't like is I don't like people reading a cartoon to me. So I thought that's what I'd do for you today. I thought I'd read you a cartoon. You know, um, and, and this is Linus. And, and Linus is one of those characters in the Peanuts cartoon. And, and Lucy tells Linus that, you know, he couldn't possibly be a doctor because he doesn't love mankind. And look what he says. I love mankind. It's people I can't stand. You know, and, and maybe you can relate to that. You know, we all know that people can be a challenge. They can be hurtful. They can be prideful. They can be careless. They can be thoughtless. And they can be tactless. And many of our challenges in life come from our relationships with people. And sometimes people have a tendency to rob us of our joy. In Philippians, the book that we're going to be looking at and delving into today in the book of Philippians, it's all about joy. And Paul says, even though he's in prison, he says, I'm not going to let circumstances rob me of joy. And even though people were talking bad about him, even though they were trying to ruin his reputation and slander him, he says, you know what? People can't steal my joy. You see, what we need to do is stop and realize is we're all people. We're people. And so sometimes we're a part of the challenge. And we all have to realize that we're fallen creatures. So we are a part of the relational challenge. I heard about a psychiatrist who was walking around uh, making his rounds. Uh, and uh, he went into one of the rooms where two of his patients were. And one of his patients was sitting on the ground doing this action. And uh, he looked at him and said, what are you doing? And the patient on the ground looked up at him and said, I'm sawing a board, can't you tell? And uh, so he said, and what about your friend? His friend was hanging from the roof by his feet. And he says, well, he's kind of off. But he's pretending to be a light bulb. And uh, the psychiatrist looked at his friend and said, you know, he saw that he was getting redder and redder by the minute. 
And he turned to the patient on the ground. He said, well, if that's your friend, you ought to tell him to get down before he hurts himself. And you know what he said? He looked up at the psychiatrist and said, what? And work without a light bulb? You know, sometimes we all have issues. And I think both of those characters had issues. What, a, what is a person to do with people that cause you challenges? You know, we think that as Christians, we should be different. That we shouldn't have challenges with other people. And we should get along better with others. And often, we don't. You see, Christians have internal struggles with the flesh, too. And Paul said in Galatians 5, verse 17, he said, what your corrupt nature wants is contrary to what your spiritual nature wants. And what your spiritual nature wants is contrary to what your corrupt nature wants. So we battle with the flesh. Sometimes the flesh wins. And when it wins, relationships are strained. The church at Philippi, was a good church. However, there were tensions within the church. And we'll see that as we look at this letter. And it's not the first time. Remember the apostles? The apostles were arguing about who would be the greatest in the kingdom of God. And then there was Peter and Paul who disagreed about things how to participate with the Gentiles and issues of the law. And then the council in Jerusalem disagreed on the requirements for salvation. And when we read the New Testament, we find out that the church, the people in the church, were not perfect people. They're saved people, they're reclaimed people, but they're working on their imperfections. In Romans 12, Paul writes, it's if it's possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. And I'm so glad he said, if it's possible, because frankly, sometimes it seems impossible. There's some people who just don't want to be got along with. But he says, if it's possible, as, long as, it, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. So sometimes people are kind of like Linus in the peanut cartoon. You know, they just want to get away from people. And sometimes people think, you know what I'm going to do is I'm just going to alienate myself from people. I'm not going to talk to people. I'm going to move away. And I don't think you can do that. I mean, maybe you can try. Maybe you can try to go off and, you know, live out in the wilderness and uh, become a recluse, live off the grid and live off mushrooms and wild honey. But I am almost sure that at some point in your life, you're going to run into another human being and have to lock eyes with them. And what if? What if we just decided that we were going to really try to be good at interpersonal relationships? What if we decided we were going to try to get along better with people? Look at this text here this morning, and it gives us some helpful ideas. In fact, some good teaching. In Philippians chapter 2, if you have your Bibles, I'd encourage you to open them there. It'll also be on your listening guide and here on the screen. Philippians chapter 2, beginning with verse 1 all the way through verse 4. You see there, there's several sentences, but in the original language, it's one long sentence. Look what it says. It says, therefore, if there's any encouragement in Christ... If there's any consultation of love, if there's any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. And then it goes on in verse 3 and says, Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but in humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourself. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interest of others. Now, when you're translating a language, or if any of y'all have ever studied a foreign language, like, for example, Spanish, um, sometimes when people are learning it, they start 
translating words into that language. And when they're translating words into that language, a lot of times what they do is they translate literally. And so it comes out as backwards. And a lot of times Spanish will say, nah, you're saying that backwards. And in English, we can say, if this happens and then this happens, then this is going to be the consequence. But in French or in Spanish, it doesn't work always that way. It often, even in English, we can say, this is the consequence if this and this happens. Today, I'm going to take in this passage and look at verses 3 and 4 and then jump back and look at verses 1 and 2. So initially, we're going to start with the essentials, the nitty-gritty of good relationships. What is harmful and what is helpful to good relationships. And I want us to see, it tells us in Isaiah chapter 43, verse 13, the devil said, I will ascend to heaven and set my throne above God's stars. I will preside on the mountains of the gods far away in the north. Folks, what is talking about there, what the devil is saying is selfish and empty conceit or pride. And these negative characteristics ruin relationships. And so let's look first of all at those characteristics that are harmful to good relationships, the things not to do to others. And the first one is don't be selfish. Look what it says here in verse 3. It says, do nothing from selfishness. Now, we're talking about the nitty-gritty of good relationships. And um, if you have kids, you know what selfishness is. In fact, if you've ever met another human being, you know what selfishness is. I actually believe that probably most people, if they had their wildest dreams come true, they would probably prefer to win the lottery than see world peace. We want comfort. We want to be overloaded with good things. But look what the scripture says here in Philippians 2, 3 in a different translation. It says, do not let selfishness or pride be your guide. So you see, selfishness is at the very heart of our fallen nature. And it is the root of every sin. Satan chose his will over God's will. And every time we choose our will over God's will, it's selfishness. It says, let nothing be done through selfish ambition. Selfishness is the me first idea. And that seed is implanted in every person. I heard about a mom who was driving her little five-year-old to McDonald's. And on the way, they saw an accident. And she had taught her children, any time they saw an accident, to pray to pray that God would help those people out, that he would send somebody to help them out and uh, to minister to them. And so she said to her son, you know, we probably should pray for that accident we just saw. And soon she heard her little five-year-old in the back seat saying, please, God, don't let them block the entrance to McDonald's. <laughs> you, you know, we understand that. that. That's human nature. But Paul says don't be selfish. And then the second thing we shouldn't do if we want better relationships is don't be prideful. Notice it says there in Philippians 2, 3, do not let selfishness or what? Pride be your guide. Now that word pride in the New American Standard is translated empty conceit. And it comes from an original word in the English language, which is, I mean, the original language, which is a complex word, kinodoxia. The word kino means, in Greek, empty, kinos. And the word doxa means glory. So what it's saying is empty glory. And it means empty conceit. And this word right there, pride or kinodoxian, is a word that's used to describe a person of exaggerated ideas about himself. Someone who's all puffed up with self-importance. I don't know if any of you have ever been out snorkeling or fishing and seen a puffer fish. Normally, they're just little bitty ugly fish, 
real small with a great big mouth. But this is what they look like when they get threatened. They get all puffed up and those spark, those little prickly things stick out. And, and what they do is they do that to scare off their predator, anyone that's going to try to eat them. Well, there are people that are just like that. When they feel threatened, they get all puffed up. They blow themselves up with pride. They get conceited. And Paul writes in Romans 12, verse 3, don't think you're better than you really are. Be honest in your evaluation of yourself. You see, Paul wasn't like that at all. He introduced himself to us in the first chapter, in the first verse, by saying, Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ. He was saying, I'm a servant, and I'm your servant. And so, first of all, he shares with us the things that are harmful to better relationships. He's, talk, he's talked to us about selfishness and pride. But then he shares with us the things that are helpful for better relationships. And the first one he speaks of is humbleness. He says, be humble. Look what he says here in Philippians 2, verse 3. Think of others as better than yourself. Now, in some translations, it says, and maybe a translation you have, it says, but in lowliness of mind. And when it translates it that way, what it's not saying is to think of yourself badly. It's not talking about thinking about yourself badly. In fact, I believe that humility is really not having any thoughts for yourself at all. So that's what he's talking about here. That's how we need to approach this. I was at a church where when you walked on stage, it'd be like on the other side of that. They had a sign for all those praise team members and band members and pastors that would walk on stage. And on the other side, it said, when pride walks on stage, God walks off the stage. Folks, God, the Bible tells us, favors the humble. So if we want to distance ourselves from God, all we have to do is be prideful. If we want to draw closer to him, we need to humble ourselves. Just a little bit of trivia. 2,000 years ago, there was the Roman Empire and the Greek Empire. And, and the Greek culture, humility was not a virtue to be desired. In fact, when they conquered people and made them their slaves, they said that they were humble-minded. They made them humble-minded. And so from their vantage point, a humble-minded person was a slave. It's interesting what they thought was a bad thing. Jesus demonstrated as a good thing. You see, that's what Jesus did. He humbled himself and descended from heaven. And he descended from heaven for you and for me. He descended from heaven to show us God's love, to provide for us forgiveness, and to bridge us back into a relationship with God. Because as the praise team sang this morning, God didn't want heaven to be a place without you. And we need to understand that. Sometimes people think that we as Christians, we think that everybody that doesn't go to our church is going to H-E-L-L. And that we're excited about it. No, folks. The God we serve, the God that we love, wants every single person to go to heaven. And he made a place like that. And humility is the fuel for good relationships. So we've thought about what is helpful. But there's a second thing he mentions in this, these verses that is helpful for better relationships. And it's to be respectful of one another. Notice what Paul says in verse 3. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but in humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourself. And then he explains that in verse 4. He says, do not merely look out for your own personal interest, but also for the interest of others. I like how the message translation, paraphrase, renders this. It says, forget yourself long enough to lend a helping hand. Let me say it. If we're together and we're trying to put ourselves first, if I'm trying to put myself first and you're trying to put yourself first, 
we're going to have challenges. We're going to have conflicts. We're, we're probably not going to get along. But if you try to put me first and I try to put you first and we're trying to outdo each other by putting each other first, we're going to be looking out for the interest of others. This past week, I saw a real cute YouTube video. of. Um, I was wanting to show it to you, but it was real blurry and fuzzy when you blow it up. So I can't show it to you, but it was of a special needs Olympic race. And there was a whole bunch of kids lined up, and they took off racing down the track. And as they're racing down the track, one of the little boys falls flat on his face, and his friend stops and helps him up. And when they get up, they look, and the whole group had turned around and were looking at him. And they walked back to them. They locked arms, and they walked down the track together and walked across the finish line. I thought that was great. Because what these young athletes discovered was that sometimes we often forget. Sometimes it's not all about finishing first. Sometimes it's about helping someone else finish. In the New Living Translation, Philippians 2.3 is rendered, Think of others better than yourself. In other words, look out for others' interest. In the NIV, it says, value other people above ourselves. Now, that goes against human nature. Who lives that way? And how do you value other people more than yourself? I mean, we live in a culture, in a society where it's me first. So how do we look out for the interest of others? Well, that's what's commanded right here in Scripture. But how do we do that? Well, it gives us a hint, some help. Who do you know better than anyone else in the whole wide world? I mean, seriously, who do you really know better than anyone else in the whole wide world? Isn't it you? You know you better than anyone else. You know what you're thinking. You know right now if you have hunger pains or if you feel satisfied. You know yourself. You know what you want to do this afternoon. No one else does. You know all about you. But who do we know? Who do I know better than anyone else? I know myself. I know my faults. I know my failures. I know my shortcomings. And based on firsthand experience, who's the worst person in the world that we know? Well, the worst person in the world that I know really well is me. I know my baggage. I know my shortcomings. And who's the worst person in the world that you really know? You. And so, folks, when we approach one another, understanding who we are and our baggage, we approach them differently. And that's what Paul did. In the New Testament, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 9, he says, I am the least of all the apostles. In fact, he says, in fact, I'm not even worthy to be called an apostle after the way I persecuted the church. Now, I don't know what you think about when you think about Paul, but when I think about Paul, I think of him as one of the greatest guys in the New Testament. And yet, he is carrying with him these thoughts of what he knows about himself. And he says, I'm the least of all apostles. And that's how he approaches others. And he tells us to do the same. He says, be humble, thinking of others better than yourself. So what's he been telling us? He's been telling us if we want to have better relationships, there are some harmful things that can harm our relationships. If we're selfish or if we're prideful. But if we want to have better relationships, there's also some helpful things we can do. We need to be humble and respectful. And those are the essentials to a good relationship. Now let's look at the first two verses that we skipped over here in Philippians chapter 1 verse 2. And let's look at the reason why we should be humble. And the first reason, the reason we should think of others better than ourselves is because our culture won't offer that to us. Our culture isn't going to offer that to us. In fact, Paul's whole point here is he starts off, verse 1, with the word therefore. And since 
He's saying, therefore, he's saying, since selfishness is all around you, it should, certainly shouldn't be among you. Therefore, the number one reason we should strive to have better relationships is our culture won't offer that to us. But the church should, and we should offer that to one another. And then secondly, because we're Christ followers. Notice he says here in Philippians 1, Therefore, if there's any encouragement in Christ, what is he saying? He's saying, if you've gotten anything out of following Christ, then you ought to be humble. Then you ought to value others and esteem others better than yourself. And then there's a third reason. Because Christ's love motivates us. Look what he says here. It's motivation. Christ's love is motivational. Notice it says there, if you have any encouragement for being united with Christ, from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, whose love is he talking about? He's talking about Christ's love. So let me ask you, what difference has Christ's love made in your life? Has he made you any more loving or any more giving? I mean, the Bible tells us in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave. Has his love for us made us any more loving, any more caring, any more giving? I heard about a lady who uh, helped in a nursing home, and she made it her life mission to go around and find patients in the nursing home that were dying, that had no family visiting. And she believed in the sanctity of life and that every life was God-given. And so she made it her life mission to sit with them during their dying hours and to let them know that there was somebody who really cared and to represent Jesus to them. You see, if Jesus is in us, his love needs to flow through us. And we need to strive to be humble, to be respectful. The fourth reason we should be humble is because we're part of Christ's family. Notice in Philippians 1, it says, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion. You see, in the church at Philippi, things were not perfect. They weren't a perfect people. And there were two dividing forces that are true in every church. First of all, we see that there were false teachings and heresy and false teachers outside of the church. And then secondly, there was fighting among the members. And the challenge here is that there's always pressure on the church from outside. For the past 2,000 years, the world has always been against the church. And unbelievers have always mocked Christ's followers. And they've always challenged their faith. But that's compounded when there's spiritual discord within the fellowship. And here's Paul's point. When Christ came and died, he covered us. He forgave us. He washed each one of us with his blood. And because he washed us with his blood, everyone who's put their trust and faith in him personally. You see, it's not about a religion. It's not about where you're going to church. It's not about the building. But it's about a personal relationship. And whoever's put their personal faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone, has the spirit of Christ. And the same spirit that's within me is within you. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13, we've all been baptized into one body by one spirit, and we all share the same spirit. In verse 2, Paul says, if you want to make my joy go over the top, make my joy complete, by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. You see, Paul is locked up in prison. But he says, you can lock me up in prison. You can beat me. 
You can speak poorly of me. You can slur my reputation, but you're not going to steal my joy. And he says, if you want to make my joy go over the top, if you want it to be like ice cream on my apple pie, if you want it to really complete my joy, if you'll live this way, you know who would really experience joy if we lived this way? You would, and I would. You see, the more we do as we please, the less we're pleased with what we do. If we live for ourselves, we're going to ultimately discover that there's no happiness in that. You see, a lot of times what we end up doing is falling victims to the world's ways and pursuing happiness rather than joy and pleasing God. And sometimes we think, you know, God, I know that you have a plan and a purpose for my life, but I really think that, you know, my ideas and, and, and what I'm wanting to accomplish are, are better than what you have for me. And so we think we can maybe, just maybe, do better than God. I mean, we think we know ourselves better than he does. And I told you we know ourselves better than anyone else. But folks, we don't know ourselves better than God does. God created us. And he created you unique. And he created you with a plan and with a purpose. And he wants us to fulfill his plan and his purpose. And I'm not going to say it's easy. But it will bring meaning and significance and purpose to your life. He said, do unto others as you would have them do to you. Who said that? Jesus said that. You know, many times we think what we really want, if we could really be honest, is we want to win the lottery and win it big. Or, or we want to go out and pick our favorite dream lottery home. But you know what? The fastest way to joy is not living by our desires and by self, but by living God's plan for our lives. You see, Jesus came as a servant and he showed us the example of how to experience and how to discover genuine joy. There was a couple that I pastored a while back and um, the wife was sharing her experience with her husband. She was married with a few kids and she said early on in our marriage my husband was the most selfish man I knew. Said uh, he worked full time but I did too and we had children but when I got home when we got home he expected me to do everything. He never raised a hand. But now as he's Grown in the Lord. He calls me at work and says, hey, I'm fixing dinner. He helps. He wants me to be a part of his life. He wants to share life with me. Folks, God wants to share your life with you. He wants to be your friend. He has a plan and a purpose for your life. Will you put him first? What it involves is it involves us humbling ourselves before him. It involves being respectful of who he is. He's not my buddy. He's not the good man upstairs. He's not Santa Claus. He's God. He's the God of the universe. He's the God who made you. And he made you intentionally. You're no accident. And he's placed us here for a reason, folks. And maybe, just maybe, he put you here at this time in history for such a time as this. He wants us to take a stand as Christ followers. You see, whatever the election outcome is, 
God is still in control. I would encourage you to vote. But ultimately, God is in control. And we need to take a stand and live for God and show his love in this country of ours that's hurting and divided and realize that, folks, what matters is Jesus and his word and how we're willing to follow it. Will you bow your heads in prayer with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for every person here. We thank you for bringing them this morning. And they may think they're here by accident, but God, we know that you were involved. And Lord, we just pray that each person here might choose to follow you, to make you number one in their lives that they might acknowledge and recognize that it's not about rules and regulations and religion, but you want to have a relationship with each one of them personally and individually, and it's their choice. It's not their parents' choice. It's not their spouse's choice. It's their choice. And Heavenly Father, I pray that today they may make that commitment to you to acknowledge their blunders and mistakes, their sins, and ask for forgiveness and invite you to come into their lives and be their guide, their boss, their Lord, their Savior. Lord, you've made it abundantly clear in your word that you sent Jesus to earth so that every single person would have an opportunity to have a personal relationship with you. He died in our place for all of our blunders and mistakes and shortcomings. Lord, I pray that if there's anyone here that's never made that choice, that today they would make that decision. Lord, there may be others here that need to follow you in believers' baptism. Maybe there's some here that are looking for a church home and you've been leading them to this place. Maybe they want to check out what Hebron is all about. Lord, we pray that you would have your way in each of our lives. And Lord, we pray that you would help us to have better relationships with you and with one another. Heavenly Father, do what only you can do in our midst, in our lives. And Lord, I pray that our heart's desire would be to say yes to you. For it's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. We're going to have a time where we're going to allow you, if you'd like, to come and pray or make a decision. I'm going to ask you to stand and join me in singing. Some of you may not feel comfortable coming forward, and I'd like to encourage you, if you would, to fill out your connection card. On the back, you can indicate uh, a decision. If you've made a decision or if you have any prayer requests, you can let us know about it. We'd love to pray for you about it. Would you join me in singing? Jesus is tenderly calling. Gidry has an announcement to make for us. Uh, 
Good morning, everyone. Um, I just, I'm here to represent the personnel committee, and we need to share that we, this week we received a letter of resignation from Philip our, uh, up here behind the drums. Um, he is leaving us. He is going to take a position with the uh, seminary in New Orleans, and uh, he's going to stay with us till November 11th, I believe. Um, so we're, we're sad to see you go. We appreciate all you've done for our youth. I know you'll be missed. Um, and just pray for him and Caitlin as they move on. So, did you want to say anything? I just want to, uh, I just want to say that my wife and I both um, have felt immensely supported here, not just by the committees, but by the entire church, um, way above expectation. So, I just want to say that, that you guys have just immensely supported us through everything. And thank you. For that. Everyone's dismissed. <laughs>